Good evening, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be with you. I regret not being with you in person. Uh, I um, wasn't organized enough this year, you know, coming out of the COVID to put together a plan for coming to the US, but Lord willing, I hope next year to be able to come over and uh, visit many of my friends in the US assemblies. I have made, a, as the brother mentioned, a couple of trips to the US for camps in the last I guess nine or 10 months. Uh, but other than that, I have, haven't really uh, done much traveling in the US since um, uh, since the pandemic. But Lord willing, I will uh, be able to uh, start doing more of that in, in the very near future. Yes, and as a brother mentioned, I'm involved with Cornerstone Magazine as well. Uh, so I'd like to, one thing that I've been considering a lot this last number of months I've been look, studying the book of Romans and in my time with you uh, tonight and then again uh, uh, on Sunday I'd like to consider with you a couple of thoughts from the the book of Romans chapter one so if you turn to Romans chapter one and we're going to read the first four verses Romans one and verse one Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. In this, these verses, we read at the end of verse one about the gospel of God. Tonight, we'd like to consider uh, verses three and four, that the gospel concerns uh, his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then on Sunday, we will consider the fact, as we read in verse two, that it was promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So Paul uh, mentions two things about the gospel. One is that it concerns his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the second thing is that it was promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. And so let's consider tonight, verses three and four, that the gospel concerns his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Of course, when we think about the gospel, we know that... Um, when we think about the Lord Jesus, we can see him all through scriptures. Uh, we can see him uh, in every, uh, every part of the word of God. And the gospel from the very uh, time when it was conceived before eternity and the eternity passed, before God created this world, it was going to center upon his son. The son would be the one who would come and bear sins, the son would be the one who would come and redeem humanity. The son would be the one who would uh, be the heir of all things. And so this, the whole plan of redemption that was conceived in the mind of God uh, before creation, but revealed in time, centers upon his son, the Lord Jesus. The word concerning in verse 3, in the original language, comes from the Greek word para, and from it we get our word uh, perimeter, and the idea is something that encircles something. Now, I don't know how much you liked uh, math in school, or for the ones that are in school still, if you like math, but I loved math, and certainly in elementary school, I, I loved math. And the thought that came to my mind is the thought of a circle and the center of the circle is uh, fr from the center of the circle out to the circumference is the radius. And if you could take a, a compass and put it on the center and draw around and make a circle. And on that uh, circumference of the circle, no matter where you are, you are the same distance to the center. It's the same no matter where you are on the, on the circumference, whether you're on the top or the bottom or the right or left or anywhere else on that circumference, uh, you are the same distance to the center. 
And that speaks to the wonderful truth that the gospel is centered around the Lord Jesus. And as believers, it doesn't matter if you were saved uh, just a couple of weeks ago, or you've been saved 20 years, or maybe even 40 or 60 years, you are the same distance positionally from the Lord Jesus as, as a brother uh, that is saved two months or, or 60 years, you are the same distance positionally from the Lord Jesus. And when we talk about positionally, we mean how God views you in Christ. God views the believer as having been, uh, having died with Christ, been buried with Christ, been raised with Christ, and, and, and ascended to the heavenlies with Christ. We are seated in the heavenlies with the Lord Jesus. That is our position. Certainly in our body, we are still here, but positionally we are perfect in Christ. And so, of course, somebody that saved 40 or 60 years, a mature believer, of course, they will be further along the road of sanctification, hopefully, and they will be closer, uh, maybe, of course, more spiritually mature than, a, than a, a young believer. And so there's a difference in that area. But from a, from a, a positional sense, we are same distance. We are as near and dear to the Lord Jesus no matter where we are on that road of sanctification, we are the same distance to him. So as we look at these uh, words in verse three, we see four main things. We see, first of all, that the Lord is, uh, Jesus is God's son. Then we see he is Jesus. Thirdly, we see he is Christ. And then we see he is our Lord. So let's just consider these uh, for a few moments. When we think about the Son, we, the fact that the Lord Jesus is the Son of God, that is something that, of course, the Jews could not accept. They, they knew that the uh, ramifications of him uh, being the Son of God is that he is God himself. So we see different ones named the Son of God uh, in the word of God, we see in the Old Testament, we see angels called the sons of God. And that speaks to, to the truth that they are sons of God in the, in the view of creation, that God created them. Uh, and so they are called sons of God. And believers, we are called uh, uh, children or, or uh, adult sons in, by the adoption, sons of God. And that's by virtue, of course, our, our salvation and being in Christ. And we have been not only become children of God, but we've been adopted into the family of God as adult sons. We have the rights and privileges of being uh, adult sons of God. And, and all that entails, we are co-heirs with Christ. But there's a, a, a huge difference between ourselves being sons of God and the angels being called sons of God by, by creation. So we by redemption, they by creation. The truth is that the Lord Jesus is the one and only son. He is a different. It says in John 1 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. It says in verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he has declared him and so the lord jesus could declare uh the father he could manifest his name as he said he did in john chapter 17 be because he is god himself he could express god in his person because he is the son he is god himself and so he is different first of all that he is eternally the son of god he always was the son of God. The angels became sons of God by creation. We by redemption, but the Lord Jesus is the eternal son of God. He always was the son of God. There was no beginning to that relationship. He just always was, it has to do with the, the eternal, the eternal nature of God. And another key difference is of course, that they, um, we be in a point in time, we became uh, sons of God. The Lord Jesus was always the son of God. And then by nature, we are just um, created beings. We are not God, 
but the Lord Jesus is the son of God in his person. He is God himself. And so that's a very clear distinction between ourselves and the title sons of God. He is unique, the one and only, the only begotten of the father. Then we also see here that he is called Jesus. And Jesus, of course, is the Greek of the Hebrew Joshua. And it means the deliverer, the savior. And so in the book of Judges, we have very many times where Israel would fall away from the Lord and they would need a savior or a deliverer to, to rescue them. And, and, they, and they would, God would raise up someone to rescue them. Well, the Lord, in a point in time, uh, according to the prophetic word in the Old Testament, where it was promised a deliverer would come, in the, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to be our savior. And so the angel came to Joseph, the Lord's stepfather, and said to him, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And so the name Jesus means Jehovah salvation. And so in that name, you saw the truth that he was God himself. He was Jehovah and that he was the promised savior. He was the Messiah, the promised one. And so he is the, the, the savior, Jesus and he's the one who um, came to die for our sins and for all that put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, he will save them from their sins. And then he is the Christ. It, that, that's the, the Greek of the Hebrew Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. And the word means he's a, the anointed one. He's the anointed one. So we could ask the question, when was the Lord Jesus anointed? He was certainly a, a promise in the Old Testament scriptures, and he was born into this world as promised, and he was uh, raised in Nazareth as in a, in, uh, with his, uh, under his parents' authority in Nazareth. And for 30 years, he lived in a basic obscurity. We only know about his birth, and we know about the a short, uh, maybe two years later, that the, the men of the East coming in and worshiping him. And then we see him at the age of 12, a brief glimpse of him. But other than that, he lived in total obscurity. He had not yet been anointed. He had not been uh, anointed into his messianic ministry. But we see in Matthew chapter three, uh, his baptism, he is uh, initiated into his messianic ministry. He is anointed. And just as we see in the Old Testament, a prophet, a priest, and a king would be anointed uh, into their office. We see that with the priest. We see that with various prophets. And then we see the example of David when he was anointed king. In the same way, the Lord Jesus, at his baptism, he was anointed into his messianic ministry. And that ministry en encompassed him being a prophet, a priest, and a king. And so we see the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and coming upon him. And he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And from that time, he began his messianic ministry, his public ministry. And so right away, his ministry of being a prophet. And we see him going around teaching and, and prophesying and, and teaching the people. Though he was anointed at the, his uh, baptism, he did, did not yet begin his priestly ministry. He began his prophetic ministry, but his priestly ministry did not begin till after his resurrection and ascension to heaven. And so we read in Psalm 110 and verse four, thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. But it comes after verse one, where it says, come here. The Lord said to my Lord, come sit here at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And so the Lord was enthroned at the right hand of God and now he's a priest forever according after the order of Melchizedek from the time he ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit uh, after the Lord's uh, 10 days after his ascension, the Holy Spirit came down and uh, initiated the church with the initial 120 believers and the, with the beginning of the church. The Lord Jesus is the, our great high priest of every single believer who's put their faith and trust in him. And so the moment you do that, you enter into the blessing of having the Lord Jesus as your great high priest. And so he began that. So, so he was anointed at his baptism, but he didn't begin the priestly ministry until his ascension. 
And then when did he begin his kingly ministry? When has he entered into his office as king? Well, the answer is not yet. He's still waiting. The Lord said, come here, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. That is still future. There's a day coming when the Lord will return to this earth uh, seven plus years after he's called his church home. He will return with us to set up his kingdom on earth and he will reign for a thousand years uh, on earth. And it's an eternal kingdom in the sense that after the thousand years, it will be merged into the eternal kingdom the eternal state, and he will reign with his father. But his kingly ministry has not yet begun. And we see that uh, foreshadowed in the example of David. David was anointed king by Samuel, but he did not become king right away. There was a, he had to wait. And so we see him waiting till the Lord, uh, uh, in the Lord's timing, he took Saul off the, off the scene. And then even then, he was initially only king of the, of the two tribes of, of uh, Judah and Benjamin. And then seven years later, he was made king over all of Israel. And so there was a waiting period. And in the same way, the Lord is in a waiting period right now. He has not yet entered into his ministry as king. So the Lord Jesus in his messianic ministry is, is made prophet, priest, and king. And then we see the word uh, Lord. And of course, the word Lord, we always want as believers to, to acknowledge that he's our Lord. Now, of course, the world does not acknowledge the Lord as, as Lord, but he is Lord. He's been enthroned over all. He, he's been, all things have been given into his hand. It says in verses 9 to 11 of Philippians 2, an acknowledgement of the, of the truth that the Lord humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And, and acknowledgement of that great work at Calvary, the Lord has given all things into the, into the hands of his son. And so it says, therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth, and, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so even today, not many acknowledge him as Lord. We have the privilege of, in a world of his rejection to acknowledge the Lord Jesus as our Lord. And every believer has that privilege. He is my Lord and Savior. He is, he is the one who is my master. He's the one who is the head of the church. And he's the one who I derive all my strength and, and power from to live this Christian life. And he's the one that we want to allow him to, to uh, guide and direct us. We want him to be obedient to him in our daily lives. And great blessing can come from acknowledging him in not only our words and our testimony, but in our very word, in our very actions and in, in life, in our manner of life, in our daily activities, to acknowledge him in our in our ways, in our the, our, our, our steps in life to, uh, to show that he is our Lord. But even though there's many that do not now acknowledge him as Lord, the Bible says someday every knee shall bow. The whole universe, angels, men, women, the whole, every single person that's ever lived, there's going, there's going to be an acknowledgement that he is Lord. And how, what a blessing it is that we have, the, have already uh, done that, acknowledge him as our Lord. And it won't be a hard thing to do in the future for us, but all the, in the future day, there's going to be many that will acknowledge that he is Lord, but it won't be as their savior. It will be as their judge. But today we have the opportunity to acknowledge him as both our Lord and as our savior. And, and, and what, a, what a blessing that is. But someday every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Now, in the King James and New King James, I like the order of the, these um, four things we've mentioned about the Lord because there's a chronological sequence to it. And so I point out to you that, in, first of all, he's the son of God, and that's from eternity. He always was the son. But at Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, he became Jesus, the one who came to be the savior and then at his baptism, he was anointed the Christ. And then after his resurrection and ascension, he was 
enthroned as Lord, that God gave all things into his hand. All things have been put under him. And so I just love the, the chronological sequence in this verse. There's, there's a time sequence to it. And then as we think about the early church, we know that two of the uh, main uh, errors in the early church uh, that, that were a constant battle regard, were, um, was regarding the person of the Lord Jesus, certainly with Gnosticism and, and other errors. And there was a denial that he was truly human. And John took that up that in first John chapter one, he said, we, we saw him, we tasted him, we meditated upon him. We, we, we meditated upon the one who was that eternal life. He was God, but he was manifested in the flesh. And when we say he was manifested in the flesh, he was a real human being. He was not just an apparition. He wasn't just a spirit as some cults teach. Or, or, or as some teach that he, at Calvary, his spirit left his body. No, at, at Calvary, his whole human being was there, spirit and uh, uh, flesh. But he was the one who was truly human in a point in time, and he is one that was always the son of God. He was the eternal one. He was deity. And so those are the two errors that crept into the early church. Some denied that he was truly the son of God. And John says, if you, if you deny that he's the son of God, you are not a believer. And you must also acknowledge that he has come in the flesh. He's tr he was truly human. And so the Lord Jesus is the one who is, is eternally the son of God. But in a point in time, he took upon himself human flesh. Now, when we say he took upon himself human flesh, we must certainly mention that that does not mean that he was God just encased in a human body. No, he became truly human. He had a human body, but he also had a human soul and he had a human spirit. He was one who was, had a both a divine nature and a human nature. And so when we say he was truly human, just as a human like you and I are tripartite, we are spirit, soul, and body. The Lord Jesus as well was spirit, soul, and body. He was a truly human being, but he, he was someone who also had a divine nature from eternity. But in a point in time, he took upon the whole aspect of being a human, spirit, soul, and body. Now in verses three and four, there's that distinction made between his humanity and his deity. It says in verse three that he was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now in scripture, this word flesh can have different connotations, but it, we have to draw from the context what the word means. Sometimes it's speaking about our fleshly nature, our, our sin nature. Sometimes it's talking about the body, but here it's talking about the truth that the Lord Jesus was somebody who was truly human because we see a comparison made with the next verse where it says he was uh, declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. And so there's a, diff there's a comparison made between him being uh, born of the seed of David according to the flesh, but he was declared to be the son of God with power according to the, to the um, spirit of holiness. So we're reminded in verse uh, four of Galatians four, that when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. And then uh, Romans eight and verse three, God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, the likeness of sinful humanity. And so scripture is very careful to say that Christ was truly a human being but he was in the likeness of sinful flesh, meaning he did not have a sinful flesh himself. And so if you saw the Lord walking down the street in, in, the, in that time period, you would have seen him. He would have looked like an ordinary man, an ordinary Jewish man. He was a truly human being. But if, if you could see in him and you could see by the eye of faith, by his words and actions, you would see that he was different. He was somebody who was without sin. 
somebody who had no sin nature, somebody who knew no sin, somebody who did no sin, who had no attraction to sin. He was the holy one. He was separate. He was different. The word holy means to be set apart. And so the Lord Jesus, though he was truly human, he was set apart from all humanity and that he had no sin nature. He's even set apart from Adam, who was made by God, created by God. Adam was made perfect. Adam was made without a sin nature, but Adam was not holy. Adam still had a, a, a possibility of sinning. And of course he did. He was able to choose to sin. He was not holy. So he was made without sin. He was made without a sin nature, but very soon he sinned. And then from that point on, he had a sin nature, which he passed down uh, through the generations. But the Lord is holy and he had no sin nature. But unlike Adam, he could not sin. There was no chance of him sinning because he is God. He is somebody who is, is God himself. And God can have no part with darkness. God can have no part with sin. And so when the Lord Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted of the devil, when, when the devil tempted him, there was nothing within him to be aroused or, or attracted to these ten, uh, temptations. In fact, he was repulsed by them. It was impossible for the Lord Jesus to even think about doing what the devil was saying. He, there was no chance of him ever sinning because he is God himself. He had no sin nature that would be attracted to these things. And so the Lord Jesus is, was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, meaning he was truly human, but he had no sin nature. And he was made of the seed of David. He was a Jewish man, but he was of royal seed. And of course, we see in the book of Matthew chapter one, he was the son of David and the son of Abraham. Son of Abraham, he was a Jewish man, but the son of David, he was born of royal seed. He had a title to the throne of David. And so that's what he was according to the flesh. But then it's, it says um, in verse four, he was declared to be the son of God. And the word declared does, is different than the word uh, made or born of the seed of David in verse three. And I like the way the King James says uh, he was made and, and it has a connotation of being conceived in, in the womb by the Holy Spirit. He was not born in the normal, ordinary uh, way of, of men. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And, and of course, the word uh, made or born in verse three is different than the, the usual word in the original Greek when it says somebody was born of someone else. And so he, the idea is he was made or he became to be in that point in time. He became to be of the seed of David according to the, his humanity. There was a point in time when he began his life as a human being. But in verse four, there's a, that distinction made, but, but regarding his deity or his, the fact that he is the son of God, that did not have a point in time when he became to be or he was made. It just was something he always was. And so it's something that was declared. Something that he always was, was declared to be. And he was declared to be the son of God with power. And some people will say that the, this uh, spirit of holiness is, refers to the Holy Spirit. And there's a capital S in, in some of the trans translations. But I would suggest to you, this has to do with speaking about deity. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God is holy. He's completely separate from, from creation. And so the spirit of holiness is a reference to deity. And, and I would suggest to you, Paul is making a comparison here between the one who was uh, made human according to his humanity, but he was declared to be the son of God according to his deity, according to the spirit of holiness. And it was with power by the resurrection from the dead. And in the, in the original language, it's by the resurrection of dead ones. And so it's got to do with the whole um, scope of resurrection. The Lord is the firstborn from the dead in the sense that he is number one. He's first in rank, as we read in the book of Colossians chapter one. 
And so some people might say, well, what about those that were raised in the Old Testament? And even the Lord himself and others raised some in the New Testament. But the, the key difference is that it wasn't a true resurrection compared to the Lord and that these people died again. They, they, they were temporarily brought back to life, but then later on they died. But the Lord Jesus is the first one who was raised from the dead, never to die again. He says, I'm he that liveth, liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He's the first one to be raised from the dead, never to die again. And praise God, there's going to be a whole uh, thousands and millions more that will follow him. We have that hope that someday we will experience the resurrection. We will be glorified. We will be perfect like Christ. We will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so we have that hope we're going to be raised from the dead as he uh, was. Him. And he, so he's the first one. And it was done with power. And of course, we see the redemption of Israel in uh, the Old Testament it was done with great power when, when um, they were redeemed by blood out of Egypt and the tremendous power exhibited by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead. And the, something that when we see resurrection and we see even humanity, those that are redeemed in a future day being raised from the dead, it's just an amazing thing when you can think about all the different ways people have died, the being eaten by sharks in the water or being obliterated by a nuclear war or dying in many different ways. God has a power to raise from the dead. The one who gives physical life, the one who gives spiritual life can certainly raise someone from the dead. And someday he will raise us. But the Lord Jesus was by, by his resurrection was declared to be the son of God. And he, it, he will further give witness to that by, by raising others. The very fact that he can raise others from the dead will show that he is the son of God. And so though he did not become the son of God uh, in that time, at that point in time, he was declared to be the son of God in an amazing way. And the idea of the word declared is, is from which we get our word horizon. And, and we see horizon is marking off a boundary between the sky and the earth. We see a clear difference between the sky and the earth. And the Lord Jesus is marked off in a unique way. He's separated. He's holy. He's marked off from the rest of creation in a unique way that no, not only is, was he a Jewish man that walked this earth 2,000 years ago that was raised from the dead, but he is the son, the eternal son of God. As we are coming close to the end now, we want to just say that this is the key or the only sign of our Christian faith. The Lord Jesus said that himself. He said that, that um, uh, to, the, to the Jewish leaders, and an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so resurrection is the key sign. It's a, it's a witness of our Christian faith. We look at in the early church when they were de deciding who would replace Judas. They said we need to have another one replace him and they will become witnesses with us of the resurrection, Acts chapter 1. And then we see during the book of Acts that, they, that their main message was the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You see, the Jewish leaders wouldn't have cared if they preached a dead Christ. They wouldn't have cared if they, they said that the Lord Jesus was crucified at Calvary. But what they couldn't accept is they were pre preaching the resurrection from the dead. And without the resurrection, there is no, no hope. As Paul shows in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection is our hope hope the resurrection is a, is the the sign that our faith is is real and as we go about our life we we want to allow people to see the resurrected power of the lord jesus in our life as we walk this earth because it is the sign and, and that's our message jesus christ is alive he is risen from the dead he is risen indeed and that's the message of the early church the Lord Jesus prophesied. We said he had a ministry of prophecy, a prophetic ministry. And so when he was asked by the Jewish leaders, what sign do you show us since you do these things? 
he said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And if it's, John goes on to say he was speaking of his body that would be raised from the dead. And so it is our, the sign of the Christian faith. And so the Lord Jesus is, is shown here in these two verses that the gospel centers around him. And it goes on, Paul goes on in just these two verses to show who that one is, the, the son of God, the eternal son of God, and the one who in the point of time took upon himself human flesh. In our time on Sunday, as I mentioned, we will look at the, fact, the truth that this gospel was promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And so I'll just turn, I'll just um, bow in a word of prayer and then and turn it back over uh, to, to, to the convener here. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you for these few words. But, oh, Father, in these few words, Father, that we see in these two verses, what, what depth there is and, and what... Um, things are said about the Lord Jesus, this magnificent person who uh, we worship, this magnificent person who we remember each Lord's Day, this magnificent Savior who saved us from our sins. And, O oh, Father, is it so we shall be like your Son? Is this a grace which thou for us has won? We're going to be like him someday. And, Father, we're going to enjoy him someday forever and ever face to face. Help us, Father, in these days when we live by faith to, to, to enjoy him in our lives, to have fellowship with him, to walk through life, enjoying our relationship with the eternal Son of God. We thank you for the, the word of God that teaches us about who he is, uh, the truly the one who, be, who was the eternal God become flesh. He became one of us so that he could be our savior. And Father, help us to be truthful and and, and, and accurate in our teaching of the gospel to, as we want to testify of the Lord Jesus by our words and our actions. Father, help us to honor and glorify him. And we pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you again for, for being with you. And uh, I look forward to my time uh, with you on Sunday. Lord bless.